But uh, we have been so, so abundantly blessed in this world today by an eternal God who loves us with a perfect love. The text of John, 1 John chapter 4, and really through the first 14 verses, I guess, may be the most complete discussion of love in the entire Bible. Most people, if you think of the chapter of love, you think of, uh, of uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Um, and it describes a lot about how love behaves, but what love is and uh, what we are supposed to understand about the nature of love is better described for us perhaps in 1 John chapter 4. Love is the greatest force in the universe. And God is the source of that love. He has given it to us. He has trained us and taught us how to love and has admonished us to love one another. And he sent Jesus into this world to show us how to love. It's hard to read through the description of the life of Jesus without seeing an expression of love in practically everything that we read. Now, it's there everywhere, but we may not always see it in some things. Uh, sometimes we see Jesus making a scourge of cords and driving out the money changers and the livestock from the temple. That doesn't look like love, but it's love for God and for His Word and for honor to Him. And if you love what's good, you have to not love or hate. What is the opposite of that? What tears that down and destroys that? And that's what Jesus is doing. When we speak of love, we're not talking about a giddy emotion. Love is something that can be known, it can be believed, it can be understood. In uh, 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 16, we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love, and he who dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. We should probably spend some time someday just on that particular verse right there and exploring all the depths of meaning and the directions that it goes. But I want to look at a little bit broader picture today. I want us to understand as we get into our lesson that if we look at the Bible description of love, uh, both in word and in example, man really doesn't understand love until he understands the love of God. People who don't know God say, oh, I love you, and, you know, and I love this, and I love that. I love pizza, and I love chocolate cake, and I love you. <laughs> What's the difference? We don't really understand love until we understand the love of God. But we don't really understand God until we understand the love of God. It would be impossible to say, I know God, without knowing something of the depth of the love of God. And I believe that we cannot really understand ourselves until we understand the love of God. Who are we? Where did we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? When we begin to think about the love of God, it was expressed one time by somebody, if you want to convey an idea to a person or to a group, the best thing to do is to wrap that idea up in a man and send the man or person. But demonstrate it. Don't just tell it. And so we can see love in the person of God and in the person of His Son, Jesus. What is love? 1 John 4, verse 8, we already read it in verse 16. God is love. If you don't love, you don't know God. For God is love. Now, God's a lot of things. We read in the Bible about the, 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 love, the love of God, the wrath of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, uh, the, the, the power of God, the knowledge of God. All of that's in there. But in this point, John, who is oftentimes called the apostle of love, for this reason, because of the depth of discussion in this chapter, and, and others as well, John is described to us as focusing our thoughts on that 
quality of God which opens the door to our access to Him. And that is His love. It doesn't really matter to us what God knows or what God's able to do if, we don't, if He doesn't have the love that invites us to be a part of His world, of His home. In uh, the Gospel of John, in chapter number 14, a beautiful chapter with many verses and thoughts that we refer to quite often. We can read this from the words of Jesus, the Son of God, beginning in verse number 7 of John 14. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. When we see Jesus, and we're studying through the life of Christ in our Wednesday evening Bible classes, and we're seeing everything that inspiration has told us about every word that he spoke, every place that he went, every deed that he did, every thought that he had, insofar as what inspiration tells us, what he was thinking, what he knew, and what he understood, we are learning a great deal about who Jesus is. And as we learn Him, we know who God our Father is. We can see the love of God wrapped up in the person of God. In what the Bible describes to us about the Father in heaven, but in what we see about His Son on earth, Jesus Christ. But we can see God also, see love also, in the parables which Jesus told and there are many of them in the Scriptures. I want to look at just three over the next few minutes, and they're all found in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. If you turn to Luke chapter 15, you'll find the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Uh, we refer to him as the prodigal son, but he was lost to the Father for a period of time. Look in John chapter 15, verses 4 through 7. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Jesus said, I say unto you, that joy shall be in heaven over one sinner who repents more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. If we think enough of our personal possessions, and especially here in this case, those things uh, which the man was either going to have for a meal or was going to sell for money to provide the things that he needs in this world. Not, not just having a sheep, but having the things that can result from raising that sheep. If we think of our personal possessions enough to protect them, to collect them, to search for them when they're lost. We understand a little bit about how God thinks of us because He created us and we are important to Him. That's a thought that many people in this world don't believe, can't accept. But you are important to God. It matters not who, who you are, where you came from, where, how you're educated, what you do in life, how old you are, man or woman, young or old, uh, boy or girl, rich or poor. You are important to God. Here's a description of what heaven is like. This shepherd went out everywhere looking for that sheep. And he continued to look. He stayed at that task until he found it. There's the love of God for every soul on earth. A little bit later, in the next verse beginning, Jesus told a parable of the lost coin. He said, What woman having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, 
doesn't light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she's found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and she says, Rejoice with me, for I've found the peace which I've lost. Likewise, I say unto you that there's joy in the presence of the angels uh, in the, uh, over one sinner who repents. <coughs> this woman is um, in the picture that Jesus paints and in the culture in which he speaks. A widow, or at least living alone. She hasn't much in, in this world. Ten small silver coins. Uh, each one might possibly be as much as a day's wage, but less than that probably. I mean, if you had only, if you could count up your assets and you had only enough to live for the next ten days, you know, that's where she was. That's not, uh, that's not very much. And she loses one of those coins, that's important to her. And look how she went after it. Gave her a good excuse to clean the house. <laughs> She swept the whole house looking for that one little coin. Couldn't possibly be over there, but I better go check. And she swept that corner also. She lit a candle in case it might be in a dark corner or under the bed or behind the dresser. And she's looking everywhere for that. Where are you today? Are you hiding from God? Have you wandered away? Are you lost from God? The picture here is the picture of God searching. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. We focus often and usually and almost constantly, I guess, on the save part. We look at this sacrifice and we look at what that means to us and how we take advantage of it, how we benefit in, God, uh, in God's eyes from the sacrifice of Jesus. But he didn't come just to save. He came to seek and to save. If he had just come to save, he would have been satisfied with the 99 sheep or the 9 coins. Wouldn't have bothered to go look for the other. But he wants everyone. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. And he doesn't just stand on the hilltop and call. But Jesus came to seek. And God illustrates that seeking in these parables of Jesus. And so we come to the next verse and we begin to read the parable of the lost son. In Luke 15, it begins in verse 11. <clears throat> he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided it unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a famine, a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him, he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave to him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. What a marvelous, marvelous story that is. We're tempted at times to just read it for the earthly story that Jesus is telling but we've learned to define a parable as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. 
The word parable itself is a Greek word, a compound Greek word, para and bolos, bolos to throw. That's where we get our English word ball. And then para, beside, alongside. To throw alongside, to put the idea, to put the idea, the lesson you're trying to teach, alongside a story that people can understand. Jesus is telling an earthly story which is probably hypothetical, but certainly is feasible and understandable. But his point is nothing about two sons or a father or riotous living or feeding pigs. It's not about any of that. It's about the love of God. In the first two parables, we saw the, uh, the one who had lost something went out diligently in search and stayed at that search until the item was found. In this case, we don't see the father going out looking for the son. He allowed the son to go. If you want to leave God and go off and live yourself, uh, waste your life in riotous living, God will let you do that. But what's God doing in the meantime? Shrugging his shoulders and turning around and going the other way and say, well, that one didn't want me, so I'll just go find somebody else. That's not what God is doing. The picture here is of the father every day spending time standing and looking down the road. Is the boy coming home yet? But when he saw him a great way off, the father ran to the boy and fell on his neck and kissed him. Amen. Greeted him. Welcome home, son. We've been waiting for you. We've loved you. We've missed you. We're happy to have you back. And the happiness spread throughout the house. All the servants began to make merry. When the father blessed the son with everything that he would have had had he never left home. He had a great homecoming, a great reunion with his father. And Jesus says, that's the way it is when one sinner repents and comes back to God. <laughs> you know, amongst people, sometimes we say, well, I love you. I love you. And then we kind of go on our own ways. And I love you when I see you. I love you when I talk to you. I, I love you when we're together. But other times I've got my own routine to take care of. And how many times have we heard a husband say, well, I just don't love her anymore. Or a wife say, well, I just don't love him anymore. That's not love. It never was love. It might have been a giddy feeling, an emotion. It might have been a, a want and a satisfaction of a particular personal desire. That's not love the way God describes love. Love is unconditional, positive regard that just doesn't quit. Love never fails, 1 Corinthians 13. And that's the love of God the Father. He had 99 sheep. If you had 100 sheep, would you even know that one of them left? How do you tell the difference looking over a herd to see whether there's 99 or 100 there? You know, The Father knows. He knows everyone. And He went out looking for the one that was lost. And He stood waiting for that one to come home. That's love. I'm here for you from now until forever. We say sometimes in the, in the marriage ceremonies, till death do us part. You know, we're together, we're for each other all the way. As long as we're here, as long as we're alive, that's what God is. As long as I live in this world. And you know, there isn't any evidence that God stops loving us if we wind up in hell at the end of this life. Sometimes the people we love hurt us turn their backs on us and do things contrary to us. But if we have true love for them, we don't stop loving them. We hurt like crazy, but we don't stop loving them. There's no indication the love of God ever ends. Even for souls who have been consigned by Him to an eternity in hell. Certainly, He loves you where you are. And He wants you to come to Him and to be everything that He has designed that you should be. We have seen the love of God in a person and we've seen the love of God in parables. We can see the love of God also in the plan. 
that He has for man in this world. God's love for us is seen in the gift which is Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew Him not. That is Jesus. The world rejected Jesus, but those who have seen that He is the Son of God and have turned and come to Him and stand with God because of Jesus, understand God and know a relationship that the world can never know. Again in 1 John, chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 that we've already seen. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation. Satisfaction. God is now satisfied. We had sinned against Him. We had offended Him. We would separated ourselves. But in Jesus Christ, there is a satisfaction to what God is owed. When we come to Him through Jesus, all that's made up, all that's forgotten, forgiven, it's in the past, it's done. It's not considered anymore. The degree to which God loves sin-ridden man clearly, loudly proclaims the love of God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, everybody knows verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him might not perish but have everlasting life. There's so much wrapped up in that verse that it would take us hours and hours, if not an entire lifetime, to really plumb the depths of that particular statement that's found in John 3.16. We won't take time to do that this morning, but a moment's pause to consider the perfect, the great, never-ending, deep love that God has for us, that He would give up His only begotten Son for everybody, for the worst wicked person in the world. Jesus died because of the love of God, because God wants that one saved. And also for the one who thinks that he's already about as good a Christian as anybody could ever possibly be. And everybody looks at him and says, he doesn't have anything to repent from. He seems like a, a perfect example. Yeah, for that one too, Jesus died because that one too is lost and needs to repent and come to Jesus, come to God through Jesus. Back in 1 John, and notice how much we're reading from the pen of the Apostle John, the Apostle of Love. But in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew Him not. We read the same verse again. Behold. What does that mean, behold? Some translations say see. Some will say look, contemplate, consider, pay attention, think about, meditate upon. It's an amazing thing that needs to draw our attention that we need to spend some time considering what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Sometimes we say to a person, I love you. I want to do good things with you. Well, will you be here and take care of me and clean up after me when I'm sick? Well, I don't love you that much. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's services you can hire to do that. But God does. He loves us that much and more. Behold, what manner of love. Well, we can see God's love for us and the gift of His Son. We can see the degree to which He loves sin-ridden man, but we can also see in the plan itself that God has given for our lives the greatness of the love of God. In the book of Romans, in chapter 8, and in verses 16 and 17, the Holy Spirit gave these words to the Apostle Paul. 
The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Children of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. How did we come to be that way? Why did we come to be that way? We came to be that way, or at least the option was open to us, because of the love of God. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loves Him that begat loveth Him also that is begotten of Him. Do you love God? You love Jesus Christ. And this we know, that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Begins with our desire to reach God. And when we love God, we believe in Jesus. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, uh, has that passage I referred to a while ago. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, faith in Jesus and repentance from sin are open to us because of the love of God. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Here in this context in which he's talking about God's great love for us, he begins by talking about confessing Christ. And he goes on then to say, so why did we bother to confess Christ anyway? Because we started out loving God who first loved us. And then we understood that Jesus is his son and we believed in him. In Acts chapter 2, when the apostle Peter preached, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard that, they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, why did they care? Why did it matter what they should do? Why didn't they throw rocks at Peter? Why didn't they just turn around and walk away? Because they saw in the preaching of the gospel of Christ the love, the mercy, the pity of God. They understood that God loved them enough to give that great gift, His only begotten Son, and wants to bless every human being who ever will live on this planet. And they cried out, what shall we do? How do you respond to the love of God? How do you respond to the love of people? I've seen situations in which one person, maybe a husband, will say to the wife, I love you. And she says, yeah, right. Or you've got a funny way of showing it. You know? Sometimes we disdain the expressions of love of other people. How do we respond to the love of God? Can we really think that God is insincere in expressing His love? That God is hypocritical? How should we respond to the love of God? But to believe that Jesus Christ is His Son, turn from our sins, confess our faith, and be baptized into Him. And then, to go on walking every day for the rest of our lives according to the light of the Word of Almighty God, just as God Himself is in the light, 1 John 1 and verse 7. Knowing that when we do that, when we walk that way, we have the continued cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. God continues to forgive us of all of our sins every day. And we have the fellowship. That's another word we probably ought to study. What does that really mean to have fellowship of all of those who have the same faith? We are one. We are together. We are held up by one another. 
We have somebody to lean on when times are tough. We have somebody that we can encourage because you know there is that built in to each human heart, the desire to be useful to somebody else. And so we have one another to encourage and to support, to guide and to walk together through this world. God's love for us is personified, parable, and planned for our salvation. And it motivates our love for Him. We love Him because He first loved us. 1 John 4 and 19. That prodigal son thought of home because he loved his father. Yeah, he really did. That doesn't say that in the text, but you think about it. Here he is feeding hogs. He's hungry. He would love to just eat what the hogs are eating. I got to go find me something to eat. I'm not going back to dad's house. That old cantankerous old goat, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with it. He didn't think that, did he? No. First thing he thought of was daddy's house. He loved his father. He didn't leave home because he hated his father in the first place. He was a little bit selfish, yeah, and a lot worldly, but he didn't hate his father. And so he turned back in his heart to the father who loved him. And then he acted on that thinking when he reflected how the father loved him. He came to himself. He said, look what dad is doing and how dad is blessing all those folks back home. Do you see other people seemingly blessed by God more than you are? Are you sometimes a little bit jealous of others? A little bit lonely for those kinds of blessings? Take time to evaluate whether possibly you might be out there feeding the hogs someplace having wasted your substance in selfish living. Maybe you need to come back a little closer to God. That prodigal son thought of his father and turned back home. Jesus said, there's joy in heaven over one sinner who repents.